Uh, welcome everyone to UTP's first ever course book roundup webinar. Uh, first, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto Press operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. My name is Mike Beyer, and I'm the sales manager for higher education at University of Toronto Press. With me today are members of the sales team, Rebecca Deuce, Samantha Scalise, and Jody Litman. Regular UTP customers will, of course, be familiar with, our, with the faces in front of you and their names, uh, and with our annual subject catalogs that we print for each of our major publishing areas. Uh, our sales team share these with customers in meetings. They leave them in department mailboxes and people pick them up at conferences. Uh, of course, this year has been quite different and none of that has happened. Uh, these catalogs typically follow a theme. For example, last year featured a variety of plants. Uh, and this year, our designer Sebastian came up with a series of pandemic theme covers for each subject area, uh, like politics, Canadian history, our Indigenous Studies, which is the view from uh, our office in Toronto, uh, with some deer added. Uh, uh, and so each is a pandemic theme. Uh, they all look great, as you can tell, and it's uh, disappointing that we weren't able to be distributing them as widely as in a normal year. Uh, so today, we're going to be going through each catalog to highlight new and upcoming titles. Uh, afterwards, We'll be happy to take questions about the books we've discussed, other UTP titles, or any other UTP-related inquiries. Uh, so let's get started with uh, Jody discussing our anthropology titles. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And just to say that if, yeah, as Mike said, we can't hand out catalogs in person, but I believe the link is in the chat and they're well worth checking out. Sebastian has done a wonderful job. They look really beautiful. So we have some wonderful anthropology texts coming out. The first of which is History of Anthropological Theory, the sixth edition. This is by Liam Murphy and Paul Erickson and will be publishing in April. You may be familiar with this text. It's been used for over 20 years in History of Anthropology courses and it's a great text for any students looking to learn about the history of the discipline. It covers anthropological theory from before 1900 into the early 2000s. And the sixth edition has been completely updated and revised. There's expanded discussions of topics such as gender, sexuality, and race, as well as entirely new sections on Zora Neale Hurston, linguistic anthropology, and the Anthropocene. It's really updated on a really thorough history of anthropolo anthropological theory. And it can be used on its own or with, with its companion text, Readings for a History of Anthropological Theory. And the sixth edition of that will be publishing later this year. In addition to this textbook, we have some really great new ethnographies coming out, the first of which is Living Inca Town by Caroline Gwaki, and this is publishing in March. It's a new addition to the Teaching Culture series, and it explores the town of Ayante Tambo, which is in Peru, and is a popular starting point for treks to Machu Picchu. And what it explores is the interactions between locals and tourists, because it's a very tourist-heavy town, and it explores how these interactions are framed by inequalities and by gender, and how they affect the town as a whole outside of the, outside of the interactions. It's a really relatable text for students who have traveled or who have potentially even been to this town. I know there's some people at, at the press who've actually been to Ayante Tambo. And in addition to the content, there are wonderful visual features, most notable of which are photo voice images, which are taken by locals in the town, as well as pen and ink drawings by the author herself. And they're really beautiful. Um, in addition to this Teach and Culture series, we also have our ethnographic series which features ethnographies presented in graphic form. And last year, we were able to add two new graphic ethnographies to the series, which you may have come across, of, have come across already. That's Gringo Love and Late and Dark Times. So Gringo Love, Stories of sex, sex Tourism in Brazil, focuses on how local women in Brazil in the town of Natal navigate intimate relationships with foreigners. Light and Dark Times is an ethnography that blends art and anthropology and theory. And it has wonderful illustrations that answer the question of how do we find hope? How do we navigate light or how do we navigate darkness while still searching for light? And it has, does this through imagined interactions between 
anthropologists and philosophers. And uh, these are depicted with beautiful illustrations. I know we've talked a lot about the beautiful visual features that we have in all our books this semester. And that is not exclusive to anthropology. So Samantha's up next and she's covering archeology span and you'll see some of those pictures as well. Samantha, Thanks, over to you. Jody. Um, just another note on the catalogs, actually, we did get a batch printed. So if anybody wants their own copy of these beautiful catalogs, we can send you one. Just let your rep know your address. Um, so archeology span is up next. These ones are housed in our anthropology catalog. It is a small list, but it is mighty. We have two titles we're going to talk about. Uh, the first is our newly published Introducing Archaeology text. It's now in its third edition. The original author, Robert Muckle, brought on a new author for this edition, Stacey Camp, in order to balance the perspective for the incoming generation. This text uh, brings discussions of decolonizing the discipline um, throughout the text. And I know this is an important conversation that's being had, so this text really speaks to that. It also brings feminist and activist archaeology into the discussion. So this is a very appealing text that brings material up to date for a new generation of archaeology students. It also comes with a full set of instructor's resources, test banks, instructor's manual, all of that good stuff, if that's what you're looking for. Um, our second text um, is Archaeology of the Atlantic North. East uh, by Matthew Butts and Gabrielle Hiernick. Uh, if that title doesn't sound familiar to you, it's because it shouldn't. It is the first text of its kind. Uh, there's no text currently on the market that focuses on the region of the Atlantic Northeast. So this is really groundbreaking scholarship going into this volume. And if you should ever judge a book by its cover, it should be this one because the cover art is an original piece by a Mi'kmaq artist, Melissa Labrador. It's really lovely. Um, it, you can check it out on our website. She has a little um, blurb at the beginning of the book, too, that discusses what, um, what the piece is about, which I think is really lovely. And it also is a nod to the fact that the book deals with the history of communities that, are, that still very much inhabit the territories that are being discussed. Something that the authors take really special care to mention throughout this book. Again, they really work to decolonize the content that they are presenting, which is really important. Um, and this one is publishing in early summer, so it's not out yet, but it should be available for next fall courses. And speaking of decolonization, Rebecca is up next with some Indigenous Studies titles. Rebecca? Thank you, Samantha. And absolutely any of the texts I'm mentioning today, like Sam noted, will work towards enhancing that discussion of decolonizing the academy. But first, I'm going to start with a highly anticipated second edition, which is Margaret Kovacs' Indigenous Methodologies. And for those of you who are familiar with the first edition, you'll know this is a entry point text for anyone who wants to learn more about indigenous methodologies, indigenous research practices, and what made it the first edition so engaging and so successful was that it creates a space to engage with indigenous ways of knowing. And I believe Margaret herself compares the differences between editions like renovating a kitchen, so the previous kitchen was nice, it functioned well. However, the newly renovated kitchen is updated and includes new features and is perhaps a more efficient use of space. So what's new about the new edition? Well, a new literature from the field is incorporated throughout. Each chapter now contains discussion questions for your students or any group you're introducing this content to. And three new chapters have been added, one on community engagement, one on indigenous theorizing, and another on an oral dissemination and capacity building. And throughout, of course, Margaret Kovach is showing us how research and these methodologies can be a method and way towards decolonizing the academy. And it was tough to choose more texts that show how this could happen, how these methods can be deployed, but I'll just mention a few now. So we have a forthcoming edited collection called Wise Practices. And what this text says is it shows how indigenous practices of law and governance support social and economic development of indigenous peoples. If you wanted to uh, follow up the call for decolonizing the academy by having your students specifically look at the obstacles to decolonization and the pervasiveness of anti-indigenous racism, please consider Jeffrey Dennis's Canada at a Crossroads and Donald B. Smith's Seen But Not Seen. 
The next book I wanted to introduce to you is a, called Intimate Integration by Alison D. Stevenson. This was published just at the end of last year, so it's available now. And this is a history of the 60s scoop and the colonization of indigenous kinship. This text it privileges indigenous people's voices and experiences is the first historical account and before a first hand account of the North American transracial adoption projects. Stevenson herself in the prologue uh, explains how she is a Métis adoptee. So this text is emotionally charged. It is a very engaging account of these projects and of these experiments. And we had actually a book launch not too long ago where Allison herself talks about this book and the, the journey to this book. So please check out that link, I believe in the chat, or we, will, we have it available on our YouTube page. Two other texts that I'll point to now are Pamela J. Downs' Collective Care and Leanne C. Letty's Serpent River Resurgence. So in Collective Care, it, we have a five-year study of the caregiving practices of Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples during the HIV AIDS epidemic in Saskatchewan. And this is also part of the teaching culture series that Jody mentioned earlier. So it's meant for really anthropology classes. However, you can utilize this text in any, absolutely any course that deals with caregiving practices, but specifically Indigenous caregiving practices. And finally, Serpent River Resurgence, we get the story of the Serpent River Ashinabek and how they confronted the forces of settler colonialism and the effects of uranium mining at Elliott Lake, Ontario. These two books draw heavily from a variety of sources. We're looking at um, interviews, archives, newspaper articles, and I think that makes them very engaging resources for your students and for the classroom. And I will pass the mic back to Samantha and we'll be talking a little bit about the offerings in our Canadian politics catalog. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, all right, so I'm going over our Canadian politics list. We have beautiful catalog right here. Familiar image for I'm sure all of our Canadian people. <laughs> um, so we have some really incredible wide ranging titles publishing, variety of course levels, kind of group them up for you. So we have um, two for intro classes, but um, Canadian politics, seventh edition by Bickerton and Gagnia, as well as Canadian regime, also in the seventh edition by Malcolmson, Myers, Mayer, and Bateman. Both of these texts are intro level, um, fan favorite texts, they've been staples for a number of years. I'm sure if you teach these courses, you've heard of them. Canadian politics for intro Canadian politics courses and regime is for more of the government courses. Both of the texts have been fully updated. They mention contemporary topics to engage students like climate change, immigration. They both mention indigenous studies throughout instead of just being designated to one chapter. Um, they include the 2019 election and um, Canadian politics is already out and regime is publishing this March. You're very excited for. Um, then we have two books on Canadian federalism, also coming out. Canadian Federalism by Boxes and Sogstad, which should not be confused with Federalism in Canada by Thomas Ulan. Federalism is very important here. Uh, both books discuss similar topics. They cover all of the, the things that you want in a federalism class, Quebec, Indigenous studies. Um, but the major difference is that the Thomas Hewlin book, so Federalism in Canada, is uh, more of a historical approach and it's still forthcoming. So that's being published in March. Um, and I know that there's a need for more books, um, course books on federalism. So either one would be great depending on how you teach your course. So, or you could get a little crazy and use both. <laughs> um, hitting a couple hot topics right now. Uh, we have the first book, Digital Politics in Canada, which was published in October. So it's out already. This one is great because it brings a lot of contemporary topics and voices together in one volume. Online politics is something we've been seeing a lot in the news lately, of course. So this text is something that will help students see how these concepts are visible in a Canadian context. For example, their technology's impact on journalism is one of the chapters. Um, and last but not least, I would like to introduce an edited collection called Turbulent Times and Transformational Possibilities which is our new text on Canadian gender and politics. And this one's really great because so much has happened in this field in the last few years with the, the hashtag MeToo, Black Lives Matter, I don't know more movements. 
Um, but it also brings topics like the alt-right and toxic masculinity into the discussion. And intersectionality, which is the buzzword of the generation, um, is really discussed throughout, which I think you can see in just a glancing through the table of contents. There's chapters on fat studies, disability studies, childhood, trans feminism, and many, many more. You should really check this book out. It's fantastic. And um, this one's out already as well. So uh, keeping it Canadian, we have some new history titles that Mike's going to go over next. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, always remember to turn your mute off before you start speaking. Uh, so I'm going to start by reminding everyone about our uh, Canadian history survey texts uh, and then highlight some of our new monographs uh, that would be valuable additions in a variety of courses. Uh, for the Canadian uh, history survey, uh, our texts are well known. Uh, we have Conflict and Compromise, which is available in pre and post Confederation volumes. Uh, these are written by a talented uh, team of authors of well-regarded Canadian historians. Uh, these books are straightforward chronological narratives uh, that help your students understand the relationships between major events and people in Canada's history. Uh, for instructors of the post-confederation course, we also have a text with a unique approach, Death in the Peaceable Kingdom by Dimitri Anastakis. This text is a direct response to the very erroneous claim that Canadian history is boring. Uh, beginning with Thomas Darcy McGee, Death in the Peaceable Kingdom uses murders, executions, assassinations, and suicides to illuminate Canada's story since 1867. Uh, the deaths featured are famous, infamous, forgotten, and metaphorical, including my personal favorite, the death of the streetcar at the hands of the automobile. Moving on to some of our monographs, uh, which as always, there are far too many to discuss, um, but I've selected a, a few personal highlights. Uh, every year we publish standout labor history books, and this year is no different. Uh, in November, we published The Violence of Work, which is an essay collection looking at workplace violence in Canada and the United States. Uh, it, it's a brief text that features eight essays on topics from sex work in 19th century Montreal to strip mining in the American West. And it provides your students with a broad survey of workers' lives over the last 200 years or so. Uh, we also have uh, a well-regarded collection of immigration history titles. Uh, and one such title this year has been Viking Immigrants by Laurie Bertram. Uh, in this book, Dr. Bertram uses a variety of sources uh, for example, a controversial cake recipe uh, to tell the story of Icelandic immigration to North America uh, between 1870 and 1914. In, in the fall, we hosted a book release webinar for this title, uh, and we were fortunate to have the First Lady of Iceland, uh, who happens to be Canadian, uh, join us to discuss Icelandic history in North America. Uh, if you're interested, you can see that on our YouTube channel. Finally, uh, the last few years have seen a run of excellent consumer and business history books. Uh, in 2020, we published Purchasing Power by Donica Belisle, uh, which looks at the roots of contemporary Canadian consumer culture, a lot of C's, uh, especially the role of women in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, I've had a lot of interest from instructors who uh, want to use this in their classes. Uh, they find that a lot of the uh, consumer and business history hasn't been focused on women's experiences and their leadership in those uh, areas. So uh, this one uh, is uh, it's a great addition to our list. And then I'm going to be handing it off to Jody, who will be discussing our non-Canadian history books. Jody. Thanks, Mike. And what a great chapter title, The Death of the Streetcar at the Hands of the Automobile. I think that's my favorite as well. And we, yeah, we're moving away from Canada now, <laughs> and we're jumping to the Ottoman Empire because just published yesterday, I believe, is our short history of the Ottoman Empire textbook by Renee Waringer. It's in the title. It's essential reading for any, to any course that's dealing with the history of the Ottoman Empire. It follows that history from its pre-origins to its dissolution in the 20th century and really pays attention to how the Ottoman Empire became such a force. It also has wonderful illustrations to help illustrate this, illustrate this history. Uh, maps, art, really phenomenal uh, pictures throughout, in full color, no less, so students will really appreciate that. 
We also have some monographs coming out, the first of which is The Saint and the Count by Leah Shopko, and this is publishing in March. This is a bit of a pedagogical microhistory. It examines the biography of St. Vitalis uh, by Count Stephen of Fougere. So St. Vitalis died in 1122 and the biography was written in 1174. And the saint's life itself is quite funny and there's a full translation included, but it's really an entryway to encourage students to understand and interrogate how historians interpret primary sources and what sort of questions they ask about primary sources, as well as the interpretive frameworks they use. So it uses a really engaging biography to push students who maybe haven't thought about how historians draw their conclusions to interrogate how they do that, how they, how they interact with primary sources, and how biography uh, comes about of a count by a saint. Um, and then another monograph is Trial of John Catherine, and this is by Sarah Beam and will be publishing in March as well. It follows a 1686 trial in G Geneva, and John Catherine was a woman who was accused of infanticide. She was accused of poisoning her child as well as the child of a rural wet nurse using candy. And what this text does is it includes translations of the entire trial, all her interrogations, including torture she had to endure. And it's a really thorough exploration of not only justice and gender in early modern Europe, but also of womanhood and crime and how these interacted in a non-supernatural trial, in a trial of infanticide. Another textbook we have coming out is History of Medicine, the third edition. This is by Jacqueline Duffin and will be publishing in July. And it's been used for over two decades in history of medicine courses for students to learn the history of medicine as well as the history of their profession. It has really great updates. There's now a new chapter totally dedicated to patient-centered medicine, as well as, of course, thorough updates that discuss pandemics, so Ebola, Zika, H1N1, and COVID-19, as well as expanded discussions of race, eugenics, as well as indigenous peoples. So it's a really thoroughly updated and very well-anticipated or much-anticipated new edition. And moving away from history now, I will pass the, uh, to steal Rebecca's uh, phrase, I'll pass the mic back to Mike, who will be talking about politics. Thanks, Jody. Uh, the, the, our history textbooks are always uh, so interesting. Uh, Natalie comes up with uh, uh, such great projects for, for teaching skills. Um, but moving on to politics. So uh, I'll be discussing our non-Canadian politics titles. Um, the subject area within politics that has seen the largest number of new books this year is definitely the environment and climate change. Uh, and the, the book that is uh, probably uh, best prepared uh, to introduce students uh, to climate change is uh, the forthcoming second edition of Understanding Climate Change by Sarah Birch and Sarah Harris. Uh, as in the first edition, this book attempts to cover both the science and and the politics of climate change. And the authors are well qualified to do that. One is a Canada Research Chair in Sustainability Governance and Innovation at the University of Waterloo. And the other one is a 2015 3M National Teaching Fellow at UBC's Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, the new edition of Understanding Climate Change has been completely redesigned to be more student friendly and the content has been updated throughout to reflect the advances in science and policy since the first edition came out in 2014. Uh, there's also a new chapter on global governance which discusses international organizations and agreements and mitigation efforts at the national and subnational level. Uh, this is just the most recent of a number of climate politics and policy books that we've published recently uh, and of course I have a few here. We have Lead for the Planet by well-known uh, environmental educator, Ray Andre, and uh, solved by uh, former mayor of Toronto, David Miller. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to some of our other textbooks. Uh, this year we've also published uh, two theory and methods textbooks. Uh, in the fall, we released a history of political thought, property, labor, and commerce from Plato to Piketty by Jeffrey Berkusen. Uh, this is an accessible introduction to the history of political and economic thought. Um, through the careful study of philosophers and economists from ancient Greece to today, this book answers the question, 
what are the effects of private property and commerce on individuals and the communities. Without an ideological agenda, this book provides students with a very powerful arsenal of ideas about the evolution of the market and a solid introduction to the history of political thought. Uh, for methods courses, we are uh, about to publish What is Democracy and How Do We Study It, which is an anthology edited by Cameron Anderson and Laura Stevenson. Uh, this book is a survey of the variety of approaches used in political science to examine the core question highlighted in the title. Each chapter focuses on a specific method or theoretical approach to try to answer what is democracy. Uh, it really provides students with a, a strong overview of the diversity of tools available to political scientists, uh, and it would be a great addition to anyone's methods course. Uh, and now over to Rebecca to talk about sociology. Yes, and our final subject for today. So thank you for keeping tuned, everybody. I'm going to begin with a unique, and if I say, if I may say very cool core textbook for sociology, and that is Seasonal Sociology, edited by Tanya K. Davidson and Ajin Park. So as you may guess from the title, this is introducing sociology through the theme of seasons or seasonality. So after an introduction that describes the discipline and explains the structure of this book, we, we get the four seasons, each containing five essays. And in all of these essays, the contributors are looking at key sociological concepts, they're modeling sociological thinking, and they're reflecting on their own original research. So throughout, your students will latch on to pop culture references they will know, but they'll also be introduced to new seasonal practices for the first time they may not have heard of. Uh, some of these topics and practices include pumpkin spice lattes in the autumn chapter. In winter, one of the chapters is looking at seasonal affective disorder. And in summer, of course, one of the instructors, pardon me, one of the contributors is looking at this summer blockbuster. So uh, other than it being a really unique, lively and engaging text, this is also incredibly classroom oriented. And for instructors, you will have a test bank, an instructor's manual, and also some sample course schedules to really show you how you can uh, incorporate it into your current text or while you're developing a new course, how it can fit into that class. The next book I wanted to highlight really contributes to the ongoing discussion and conversation on anti-Black racism and also provides much needed education on anti-racist strategies. And this is Rosalind Hampton's Black Racialization and Resistance and Elite University. So in this text, she's gathered over 50 years of Black people's experiences of studying and teaching at McGill University in Montreal. And she's including quotes and commentaries from Black learners, academics, organizers, activists, students, and to really show from the classroom to the boardroom how Blackness and specifically anti-Blackness functions within society in general, but also within the higher education, within the academy. And two other texts that I think really complement the topics within Hampton's book and investigating the, the power struggles that are going on within the academy are Power and Everyday Practices, second edition as a core text, and also Kenneth Stern's The Conflict Over the Conflict as an, another important analysis of academic life. So in Power and Everyday Practices, it's a core textbook looking at power and social inequality in Western societies. Like Hampton, this book is encouraging students to turn their own social worlds inside out and recognize the various levels of power within their lives and within the institutions they attend or participate in. And like seasonal sociology, power in everyday practices also comes with a lovely suite of instructor materials. As for Kenneth Stern's The Conflict Over the Conflict, we're again looking at power and privilege in higher education, but we're doing so by looking at the Israel-Palestine campus debate and what this means for questions of free speech, uh, academic freedom, and the future of the academy. And to conclude sociology, I will point out two other really compelling books 
written for the classroom. And the first one is Amplify by Nora Bowman. And the running joke is that my colleagues here are not surprised I'm talking about Amplify because given any platform, I will talk about Amplify. And why? Well, because this is, a, again, a unique text that shows and tells the stories of graphic, sorry, of feminist resistance. So they're looking specifically at famous or maybe lesser known social movements and feminist activists. Some of these uh, people and in, in movements include uh, Kathleen Cleaver and the Black Panther movement, uh, Idle No More, Harsha Walia, and many more. So another reason I really like Amplify is because it's a graphic narrative, because it comes with all these other pedag pedagogical materials, so you're engaging multiple learning styles within your classroom and allowing all of your students to engage with a text in different ways. And they're gonna have fun answering the discussion questions and starting debate in class about all of these very important topics of gender roles, intersectionality, and of course, power. Finally, for any criminology instructors out there, I will recommend Eeyore Boyanowski's Crime and Criminality. This is a highly readable text peppered with personal anecdotes that looks at crime and criminal behavior through a range of theories. So it's a comparative text for your criminology class that's looking at criminology, criminology la, crime theory, absolutely anything within that discipline. Okay, so now I will again pass the mic back to Mike and we're going to discuss a very important textbook. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, so we, we had to save one book for the end uh, because we couldn't decide who was going to get to present this book uh, because we're all so excited about it. Um, so we made it a team effort. And honestly, the, the team approach is probably the right fit uh, because the book is titled Political Science is for Everybody. Uh, this is our soon-to-be-released intro poli-sci text, edited by Amy Atchison from Valparaiso University in Indiana, and it features a diverse and talented collection of contributors from all over the world. Uh, Political Sciences for Everybody is the first intersectionality mainstreamed textbook for intro political science courses. Uh, I tried writing a description of uh, what this means for the text and why it's important, uh, and then I realized that it's best explained by Dr. Atchison in her intro chapter, which we've made available for preview. Uh, that will get shared in, in the chat. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, we've been really excited about this book. Um, it's not often that as a, uh, a group of, uh, as a sales team that, that talks about textbooks, that we get to sell a, a book that is, is trailblazing like this. Um, so each member of the sales team has chosen a favorite chapter to discuss, and we're going to go in order of the chapters, starting with Jody speaking about chapter two. So Jody, thanks, Mike. And yeah, I'm quite. We're all quite excited about this book. So the chapter I'm talking about is chapter two: political theory and the intersectional quest for the good life by Keisha Lindsay. And I've chosen this chapter. It really stood out to me because. After the introduction, I think it's so essential to have a accessible way for students to engage with how intersectionality can help be a helpful tool through looking at political theories. And Dr. Lindsay really does this quite well with looking at the good life. So it was a really great job of introduce, introducing students to the ways that intersectional approaches enable critical engagement with both theory as well as state responsibility, particularly in regards to facilitating and defining the good life. So she explores what it means to have a good life, as well as the multitude of answers political theorists have historically offered, as well as how an intersectional approach to this question enables political theories to be expanded as well as explored in their limits of who has access or who has historically accessed the good life and who has been deemed qualified. It's a very nuanced discussion. It's really engaging. And she uses such pertinent examples, particularly towards the end of the chapter she uses the re very relevant and very recent example of the legalization of gay marriage as a as a way in which the state has enacted policies to 
um, in, to expand who has access to the good life while also defining what constitutes a good life. So she really explores all the nuances about this discussion and all the limits as well as um, unlimited ways that intersectionality can help us engage with political theory. And it, it did a really wonderful job of priming students to engage in this way. And I think next we have Rebecca with chapter six, if I'm correct. You are right, Jody. So chapter six looks at electoral systems and representation. And this is written by Jennifer M. Piscopo. And I was drawn to this chapter, admittedly, because I don't know enough about electoral systems, especially about systems beyond North America. So I really appreciated how uh, Jennifer Piscopo included examples from the global south and the electoral systems around the world. So she starts by describing different types of representation and then explains how different electoral systems and changes to those systems matter for representation. And also she debunks myths that we are hearing about the ineffectiveness of diversities and strategies to increase diversity. And so I, I, I left this chapter feeling more informed and more confident to critically watch local and international news stories on this topic. But also the pace and logic of the chapter just made sense. I didn't feel like I was being bombarded with different types of information and I really uh, retained what I learned. And um, Mike, what was your favorite chapter? Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, my favorite chapter was chapter 11, uh, which is Public Policy Through an Intersexual Lens by Raul Pacheco Vega. Uh, and what I really like about this chapter is that right from the start, uh, the author is identifying why uh, an intersectional approach is both valuable and suitable for public policy studies. Um, he explains that public policy studies are already interdisciplinary, so the scholars should, should be comfortable with multiple approaches and perspectives. Uh, and also public policy affects everyone living within a government's jurisdiction. So it should be considering all of their needs and interests, even when it, it can't uh, or won't meet those interests. Um, and it, it, like, this seems obvious when it's laid out uh, in a clear way as the author does, but of course we know that that isn't the case. Um, public policy has not been intersectional. Um, but these ideas are, are starting to appear in actual government policy. Uh, for example, the Trudeau government has been using a gender-based analysis in its budgeting process. Um, but uh, for me, it, it seemed like uh, including this perspective in a student's first uh, politics text will really help broaden their perspective as they progress through their academic and, and possibly uh, public service career. Um, it will only make uh, more informed uh, and thoughtful citizens, uh, which I think we uh, know that we could all use a few more of those. So, and then moving on to our final chapter with Sam, who is going to be talking about uh, an IR topic. Sam. Yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, this book is just so great. I had a hard time picking. Um, I decided to land on chapter 16 because it's from the third part of the book on international relations. And I did my undergrad in development studies, so it kind of resonated with me. Um, so this chapter is the last chapter of the book. It is on international organizations, written by Jillian Hanglin from U of Kentucky. And I think this is a particularly great way to end off the text because it expands the discussion of intersectionality and governance to a global stage. So uh, this chapter defines, compares, contrasts international government and non-governmental organizations and then their roles and priorities and impact. But it also highlights the power dynamics and the representation that underlines each group, which is unique, I believe, to this book. And I love the way that Professor Hagelin outlines the information in the chapter in general. Um, she highlights, Organizations like the UN, the IMF, they're clearly defined and contextualized with real world examples, which I loved. And I think that when I was learning these concepts in my undergrad, I struggled to see how IGOs and INGOs complemented each other in practice, and then how my values and my interests might fit in to those, exploring a potential career in that space, which I think is done very beautifully in this chapter. And I think if I had this book to read in my undergrad, 
I would have been uh, much more informed on the realities of these organizations, but as well as that, I would have been equipped to pursue a career in this area, potentially, cognizant of all of these things, but also my own position and my own privileges, which is important, I think. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more about that last part. Uh, through five years and two degrees in political science, uh, I don't think I once heard uh, intersectional or intersectionality, uh, and I, I didn't really learn it and understand it in, until I actually started at UTP and I had to sell books that were that were talking about this stuff. Um, so we're all very excited about it, as, as we are about all of our books. Um, uh, but this one has has gotten the sales team particularly energized. Uh, now we're going to take a few questions. Uh, and we have some uh, already, uh, uh, some very straightforward ones. Uh, so how do I get uh, exam copies of any of these? Uh, Sam, do you want to explain the uh, exam copy process? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a couple ways you can get an exam copy. The first being contact one of us. Um, our information is um, in the invitation, I believe, to the webinar as well as on our core instructors page on the UTP website. Um, you can also request digital copies yourself by visiting each tech web page and then clicking the request an exam copy button to follow the steps. All of them are available both as digital and paper copies, but if you don't want to bug up your office with more paper copies, digital is always an option. Excellent. Um, the another question um, uh, ebook availability um, are all the books available as ebooks Jody uh, can you take this one yes of course and yes all our books are available as ebooks and they're also available through all the major vendors so you can get them through our website directly but you're also welcome to look at Google Playbooks um, Amazon and um, Amazon Kindle Store, as well as Red Shelf, Vital Source. So all our books are available in books, yes. Great. Uh, and uh, contacting a rep uh, and, and meetings. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to explain uh, people's options for, for talking to us? Oh, absolutely. Please feel free to contact us. But if you're confused about who is your rep, please go to our four instructors page. It lists our contact info as well as the areas we cover within our territory. And we are happy to host video calls, phone calls, emails, whatever is easiest for you. And we would love to hear from you. Again, turn the mute off before you start talking. Um, so uh, we are coming up on the end of our time. Uh, so one of the other questions that we got was uh, instructors, materials. People are asking about test banks and such. Um, so uh, for there's a page on our website for instructors that lists the books that have their ancillary website. Uh, and uh, which ones have and what type of materials. So test banks, instructors, manuals, um, classroom activities, those sorts of things. Uh, you can also, as several of us have mentioned, the, for, the, the uh, Find Your Rep page on our website is also useful. Just email one of us. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any of these questions in particular. Um, and I think that, uh, is there anything that anyone else wants to add? Anything that uh, I forgot to mention? Any questions or comments? Things that they, you often hear in-, in I was gonna just say, maybe we should quickly go over our territories to make it easier for everybody. <laughs> in case you wanted to contact us right away. Um, so I am in charge of Eastern Ontario, um, including most of the Toronto schools. Ryerson um, and Quebec, and then most of the eastern United States. But if you have a specific state, you can probably check the website. Rebecca? Yeah, I Rebecca? All right. Uh, for my Canadian area, I have 
most of Western Ontario, most of the schools that start with W, so Windsor, Western, uh, Laurier, please contact me, but also Lakehead, all of Manitoba, and all of our Atlantic provinces. So hello over to Newfoundland and PEI and Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. And then for my um, American territory, I have Michigan, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Texas. And Jody? Yeah, I might have to look at my list because my <laughs> units are pretty extensive. But as for Canada, I have all Ontario colleges, except for Algonquin College, as well as Ryerson, uh, Nipissing, and Laurentian, and uh, Ontario Tech, as well as uh, Yukon, Nunavut, and Northwest Territories. So schools in those districts or provinces. Um, for your U.S. territory, yeah. it's just anything that we haven't mentioned, really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And as for the U.S., it's pretty much the middle, like <laughs> quite a bit of the middle and the deep south. So I won't, I won't list them all, but the, the main ones would be Minnesota, Wisconsin, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, um, just qu quite the, just the middle bit of the United States, Utah. So if you're, uh, I can list them all, but I, you it's find them on our website. Go right? to the page and look at look at your state, but. It might be me if it's in the middle of the U.S., but Mike, sorry, back to you. And then me, uh, I have Western Canada, so Saskatchewan West, uh, and then all down the Pacific coast of the United States, Oregon, uh, Washington, California, and uh, Colorado uh, is my lone holdout in the, in the not on the coast. Um, yeah, uh, we're looking forward to actually being able to visit campuses again. Uh, this webinar has been a lot of fun, but uh, it's not quite the same thing as uh, getting to knock on doors and, and uh, see the, the energy on campus in the first week or two of school. And, uh, anyway, uh, thank you to everyone who attended uh, and listened to us speak about our books. Uh, if you have questions, contact us. Uh, oh, we have a question uh, about the ethnographic series. Uh, so, uh, do we foresee this staying with the more anthropological side, or are there many titles being proposed for other sister and complementary disciplines, Indigenous studies, sociology, etc.? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, this series is in the hands of an editor who uh, acquires for uh, both uh, sociology and anthropology. So, technically, it, it will continue to focus mostly in anthropology, and I think all the forthcoming ones are uh, anthropological. But uh, I would imagine that uh, Carly, uh, our editor, would be uh, quite interested in hearing proposals about other books. We, we have started uh, publishing um, graphic books outside of the ethnographic series. Uh, in the spring, we'll be publishing uh, a graphic version of a famous early modern Spanish novel called Lazario de Tormes. Uh, and I believe that we also have uh, another historical uh, graphic book in the works. Um, but uh, yes, if uh, Aaron Gould asked this question. So Aaron, if you uh, are interested in talking to the editor, I can put you in touch with, with Carly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, Anything that I can, any the other reps want to add that? No? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Um, bye.